ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله بارك الله فيكم may Allah ta'ala bless you all so inshallah ta'ala if you know me you know we're not going to be here too long so you, you, you focus you can focus inshallah ta'ala get you home inshallah so after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and send the salutation upon the best of mankind this is what we're doing today um, they asked me to speak about this book earnest advice to my brothers and sisters from the WD community for those not familiar with Imam Warafdi Muhammad, he is the son of Elijah Muhammad, the, fa- the former leader of the Nation of Islam. And when his father died in 1975, Warath Dean was elected as the new leader of the Nation of Islam. And over the next few years, he transitioned many of them to what was intended to be mainstream Islam. Now, there's no doubt that Imam Warafdi Muhammad had a large group of supporters and loyal followers who considered him to be the Mujaddid, the reviver of Islam. So I understand this is a sensitive issue for many people. And there are other people who don't consider themselves to be followers or, or members of the WD community, but they believe that what if the Muhammad deserves praise and credit for leading the nation of Islam to Orthodox Islam. So as a result, many people were uncomfortable when this book came out. Many people were upset. So what is the purpose of the book? One clarifying mistakes, it protects the religion. As Shaykh Ahmed al-Najmi, he said, the slip of a scholar that contradicts the Sharia is a breach in the religion. If it is made clear to the people, the breach is patched and closed and sealed up. But if others try to apologize for the person that, they, that, that made the mistake and justify his mistake, the gap widens and causes corruption in the religion. Number two, that's the other reason. Clarifying mistakes is an obligation. Sheikh Saleh Fawzan, may Allah ta'ala preserve him, he said, refuting those in error unites the ummah because this clarifies the truth and the ummah can only unite upon the truth and they will not unite upon falsehood. Therefore, refuting those in error is an obligation. Allah refuted those in error. The messenger, alayhi salam, refuted those in error. And the scholars refute those in error. And it's not permissible to remain silent upon those in error because this is deception upon the Muslims. And aiding those and promoting those in falsehood. And it becomes even worse if you not only remain silent, but you praise those who are in error. The third reason, Yaquan, is that when you clarify the mistake, who does it benefit most? The person that made the mistake. Right? Because the, the people who are deceased and what if the Muhammad, he died in 2008. He's deceased. They are responsible for all the misguidance they left behind. And so when their mistakes are corrected and less people follow their mistakes, you benefit them. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ دَعَى إِلَى الضُّلَالَ كَانَ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْإِثْمِ مِثْلُ الْآثَامِ الْمَنْ تَبَعَهُ He said, whoever calls to misguidance, Upon him is the sin of all those who follow him in that, without decreasing their sin at all. Yusuf ibn Asbat, ta'ala, he criticized the man. And somebody said to him, aren't you afraid of backbiting? He said, be quiet. He said, I am better for them than their mother and fathers. I forbid people from following their innovation, causing them to incur sins. But those who flatter them are really more harmful to them. Now, also, for those people that feel uncomfortable when what of the Muhammad is criticized, he criticized people. When he found people who disagree with him, he criticized them. And sometimes he would use harsh language. He calls those imams who disagree with him, he said, they are dumb imams. He criticized people. Also, what's important to know, what's obligatory to know, is what of the Muhammad was not ma'asum. He was not infallible. And to believe that he was infallible is to believe that he was a prophet. 
Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, ta'ala, he said, whoever deems anyone after the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to be infallible, such that it is obligatory to accept everything he says, then surely he has given him the meaning of prophecy, even if he doesn't call him a prophet. So it's not permissible to place W.D. Muhammad as the status of the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, such that you accept everything he says and everything he believes without weighing it against the Quran, the Sunnah, and the understanding of the Sahaba. And also, for those that don't like what of thing being criticized, he said he didn't mind being criticized. He gave a talk at Duke University. Where's Duke University at? Durham, North Carolina, right? (laughs) He said, in fact, just recently I got a letter and I was accused of trying to make Islam palatable to the Americans at the expense of Islam. But I accept that kind of criticism. In fact, I told the editor of our paper they should put the letter in the paper Publish it and let the readers see what they are saying about me. I accepted the criticism. I appreciate criticism. I want to be criticized. So here we go. Now, we're not trying to question his sincerity, as being sincere is an affair of the heart. Only Allah Ta'ala knows. But if a person makes a sincere mistake, they still have to be criticized. The great scholar Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Muallimi, he said, No, indeed, Allah may cause sincere people to fall into error as a test for those who follow them to see will they follow the truth and abandon the person's statement or will they be deceived by the virtue of the person? All right, so now let's get into the research of the book. What kind of research was done? These statements that are in this book by Warathri Muhammad have not been dug up from buried sources. Rather, these statements have been transcribed, published on the internet, printed in books, burned on CDs, and they're widely sold and distributed today. There is something called the Imam Wadaf Din Muhammad Preservation Project. And they said, we have 500 to 1,000 lectures of Imam Wadaf Din Muhammad between 1975 and 2008 that have yet to be published. The Imam Wadaf Din Muhammad Preservation Project is dedicated to transcribing these lectures and making them available to the believer. Those who realize the importance of the teachers of Wadaf Din Muhammad that must be preserved and studied for decades, if not centuries, to come. They said there has not been a more important man upon the face of the earth since Prophet Muhammad. This is what they said about him. So what I did, I went to this website, to this Imam Word of the Muhammad Preservation Project, and I downloaded 1,700 of his lectures and read all of them. Read all of them from 1975 to 2008. And then I bought about 12 of his books. And then I listened to lectures and videos, and all of this is where the research came from. So it took a while. So all this stuff is what they are selling. They are... um, Putting out. So all of what I just mentioned is an introduction. So inside the book, the first thing that I mentioned after the, the introduction is the six pillars of faith, which is what? And to me no billah, wa malakatihi, wa kutubihi, wa rasulihi, wa yom al-akhir, wa qadrihi, sharihi, wa khayrihi. Naam. So the six pillars of faith. What if the Muhammad, how did he look at the six pillars of faith? He said, if you were to hear a Muslim say what are their articles of faith and the important statements of faith, and then listen to a Christian say their articles of faith, you see they're the same. So because he saw it like this, he had a lot of errors in the six articles of faith. And that's what I start with, all right? And keep in mind that what if the Muhammad, he said to his followers, He said, so if I come from myself and start ordering things on my own without respect from the sources I'm supposed to be obeying, then you reject me as your leader and don't follow me in those things. So he told his followers, if he says something against the book of the Sunnah, don't follow him. So now we're going to see. So, for example, I start with the belief in Allah. 
And I mentioned the belief, and then I mentioned an ayat from the Quran or hadith, and then I mentioned the belief of Warathi Muhammad. So here's an example. Our belief is that Allah is the creator and the Lord of the universe and the only true God, right? Indeed, your God is one God, the Lord of the heavens and the earth and all that's in between them and the Lord of the two east. What the Muhammad said, the black man is the God of the universe. He said, the original man is the Asiatic black man, the maker, the owner, the cream of the planet, the father of civilization and the God of the universe. Now, Interesting here. This statement is from 1975. So someone may ask, well, why are you posting statements he made in 1975 when they had not completely separated from the nation of Islam? That's a good question, right? That's the question I asked. Why are they posting these statements from 1975? This statement is from the Imam Wafi Muhammad Preservation Project. They posted this statement. So keep in mind, somebody had to listen to these lectures, transcribe these lectures, send them to the editor, and publish them. So they accepted these, all these beliefs that he was saying. And so you're going to find in this book, we have statements from 1975 to 2008, and his statements are very similar. From 1975 and, and 2008 when he died, it's the same Aqidah. All right? Another example is we believe that Allah Ta'ala is where? Now, Allah Ta'ala does not dwell in his creation. Rather, he is above his throne in a manner that's befitting to his majesty. He is separate and distinct from his creation, but his knowledge is everywhere, his sight is everywhere, his hearing is everywhere, his power and control is everywhere. And what's the... How do we know where Allah is? Because he told you where he's at, right? He said, well, who was called here with folk and And he is the dominator above his slaves, Right? And we know that the messenger of Allah, alayhi salam, he asked the slave girl, I ain't Allah, where's Allah? Fi sama, above the heavens, right? Well, the Muhammad, and, and page 20 of the book, he believes that Allah Ta'ala dwells inside mankind. He said, we believe like the Christians that God is not only in heaven, but God is also in us, in every one of us. He made this statement in 1999. In 2003, he said, no person is God, Though God is present in all of us, not only that, God is present everywhere. Okay? Now, also inside the book, we go through the six pillars. We go through belief in the angels. He doesn't believe in the angels. And he, sometimes he says that the, the, the men who do metaphysics are angels. He doesn't believe in the jinn. He doesn't believe in shaitan. He said that the original devil is dead. Then we go th- through the... Uh, our belief in the books. Then we get in the belief in the prophets on page 46. Okay? And subhanAllah then. There's an issue here about the ruh, the angel, Jibril, and Maryam. And this is on page, in the book on page 45. Allah Ta'ala, he mentions that Maryam, the one who guarded her chastity, and we blew meaning into her garment through our angel, and we made her and her son a sign for the worlds. Ibn Kathir explained that Allah Ta'ala commanded the angel Jibreel to blow in the sleeve of Maryam's garment, and the breath went down, and by the word of Allah entered her womb, and she became pregnant. That soul became a, a, a creation, a soul that Allah Ta'ala created. What does Wafi Muhammad say about Maryam? He said, if we read the Bible as cardinal language, it's telling us that Mary was raped. It is saying that she was overpowered by the Holy Ghost and became pregnant with child. Now, what does overpower mean? Overpower means to take by force. If Mary was one of our girls in the, or the girls in our community, what do you think the court would do to the Holy Ghost? If Miriam would go to court and say what it says in the Bible, I was a virgin, your honor, and this Holy Ghost came and overpowered me. The judge would say, look, this woman is an upright woman and truthful woman. She is known to be righteous and truthful. If she says you raped her, then you raped her. Holy Ghost, 20 years in prison. It's foolishness. 
Worth it. And also in this section, we mentioned how he belittled the miracles of the prophets. He denied the flood of Noah. He claimed that Jesus Lamb was crucified. He said that many times he's crucified. And he said that he's not coming back. And he said that the splitting of the sea was child's play. He said that Ibrahim was not thrown in the fire. Also, there's a section that we speak about the infallibility of the prophets. The great scholar Imam al Qurtubi, may Allah have mercy upon him, he said it is a consensus that the prophets and messengers were not assumed. They were infallible with regards to major sins. The prophets and messengers never committed major sins, despicable acts, or immoral, dishonorable deeds. So therefore, as Muslims, we reject what they say in the King James Bible. We don't believe that. Okay? How about Wafti Muhammad? On page 56 and 57, he said, let's go back to the scripture. The scripture says that no other prophet got drunk and was lying nude. He says that over and over again. He keeps on claiming that Prophet Nuh was a drunkard. Also in this section, he insults Prophet Yunus. He insults Hajr, the wife of Ibrahim. And he claims to be the Mahdi. Then we go to the section about belief in the hereafter. and um, starts on page 63. And he denies the existence of paradise and the hellfire in the hereafter. He believes that they're in this life. He believes that hell is inside your body. He said, in paradise is wherever you want to make paradise. He, he, he said, I'm in paradise right now. In fact, he mocked the verses about paradise being in the heavens. He said, Allah says that he will give us a garden. The extent of it being the extent of the skies and the earth. Now, you know, that's really mysterious, isn't it? I'm going up with my team and I'm going to plow the skies. God said it's my garden, so I should be able to go up there and plow the sky, till the sky. Now, you know, the one who needs to go to the real clinic, they'll be the ones seriously talking about getting that plow in the sky, mocking about the heavens. Right now, then we go to the next section is about the claims of Wafti Muhammad. Right. So, so you see, we have a section, right? We have belief. Then we have, you know, we go through the six pillars of Islam, and then we have a section about the claims, things that he claims that he made during his lifetime. For example, he claimed that he was the manifestation of God. He said, speaking in the language of the New Testament, my father is God. I am the manifestation of God. And this, again, is a lecture that was published by the Imam Wadafdi Muhammad Preservation Project. He claimed that he was greater than many of the prophets, and he claimed that the, his zodiac sign, because he was born in October, as was his father, he claimed his zodiac sign was a scorpion. And this is proof of his leadership. And keep in mind that we, um, at the end of the book, we put the um, QR code for a YouTube channel. And so we have about 40 or 50 videos showing him saying these things. So... People won't think that they're made up, and you can get the context of, of the, the kind of the pride that he says these things with. All right? The next session is the tafsir of Wafti Muhammad. He, he also has tafsir, and his um, community has published several books of his tafsir of the Quran. And so we, we bring an ayat from the Quran, and we bring the tafsir of one of the ulama. And then we bring the tafsir of Wolf Dean to show a comparison. This is how the Salaf give tafsir, and this is his tafsir, right? And of course, the great scholar Ibn Taymiyyah, he said that the Quran is explained with the Quran. If you can't find anything in the Quran, then it's explained with the Sunnah. If you don't find anything in the Sunnah, you go to the statements of the Sahaba. Nothing in the Sahaba, you go to the Tabi'in. Nothing in the Tabi'in, you go to the Arabic language, okay? So because he didn't follow these principles, it's filled with error. Because many times he would make tafsir using English language. Here's an example. Allah Ta'ala says, And have taqwa of Allah, the one for, for whom you, you ask your mutual rights and the womb. Meaning have taqwa of the womb. So Ibn Kathir, he gave the tafsir of the student of Ibn Abbas who was Mujahid Ibn Jabr. He said, have taqwa of Allah means to obey him. And have to, have to have taqwa of the womb means to not cut the ties of kinship. That's the tafsir of Ibn Kathir. What of Dean, he says, about this very same ayah in his tafsir. He said, we should love 
Allah the Most, who has told us to reverence the tithes. So he's translating the word as taqwa as reverence. All right. He said, look at the language he uses. Reverence the family ties. We give reverence to a special preacher and call him Reverend so-and-so. We give him special treatment and tell the children, you have to wait until the reverend eats. Maybe he'll leave you a wing. But Allah says reverence the family ties. Tafsir with English. Right? Another example. Allah Ta'ala says, مَا خَلْقُكُمْ وَلَا بَعْثُكُمْ إِلَّا كَنَفْسٍ واحد. Your creation and your resurrection is not except as one soul. Ibn Kathir says, this means the creation of all mankind and the resurrection of the day of judgment as it relates to the power of Allah is like creating one soul. It's easy for him. What the Muhammad said about the same verse, he said, Allah says your life and your resurrection is as of that of one living soul. What is Allah telling us? Allah has given us great help. A new day is here. A bright day is here. Relief has come in one soul. Barack Obama. <laughs> Another example. Allah Ta'ala said, فَتَلَقَّ آدَمُ مِن رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ And Adam received from his Lord some words, and he accepted his repentance. Ibn Abbas, he said, may Allah Ta'ala please them, Adam received words of repentance from his Lord, and they were, they said, our Lord, we have wronged ourselves. If you forgive us not and bestow and, not, and, 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 and do not have mercy upon us, we shall surely be from the losers. Surah Al-Araf, verse 23. Right? Worth Dean said, it says that Adam met. Now, I want somebody to tell me, does anyone know the mistake here? He's saying it said that Adam met a word from his Lord and he repented. I believe that to mean not in his own time, but much later in history, in the rise of man. And I can tell you exactly when the time was. It was when Jesus Christ was born. In Jesus, Adam met a word from his Lord and repented, and Allah accepted his repentance. What's the mistake? Instead of, he took the word to be Because he didn't know the Arabic language. Talaqqa means to receive or learn. Lakia means to meet. So he translated it wrong. All right? Nah. So, and we also, I mean, he also gave tafsir of silent night. He said that silent night, and, and we have that in the book. He said it's the night of decree. He said it's the night of decree for the Christians, but the Christians just don't know it. He also, on page um, 89 in the book, he gave tafsir to Old MacDonald had a farm. Um, also in the book, we mentioned some of the, um, he gave the explanation of a hadith, and we mentioned that. Also in the section of the book, there's a question and answer section. So in this section, he was asked a religious verdict. And so we mentioned the religious verdict that he gave, and some of the early might asked the exact same question, and we mentioned the verdict that they gave. Questions about dating, Muslim women marrying non-Muslim men, wearing hijab, celebrating Christmas, Christmas, youth dances, the Freemasons, shotgun weddings, and more. All right, so we have a section about that. We have a section about following the Sunnah and accepting Hadith and his rejection of the Sunnah. And we have a section about how to distinguish the Sunnah from Arab culture. This is a very important point, right? No one has instructed black American Muslims to adopt Arab culture and abandon their own culture. Anyone who says that the Salafians in America are trying to be Arab are disingenuous. It's just not true, right? We know that the black American Muslims, because that's their argument, you, you're, you're trying to be Arab, right? We know that the black American Muslims have a distinct, recognizable dress and style. Jeans, Izzars, Timberland boots, Thobes, colorful socks, Jordans, and Philadelphia fur coats. True? Have their own style. Even different people down south, the Muslims dress different than people up north. So everyone has their own style. No one is telling people to leave their culture. But the problem comes when you can't distinguish with what is Sunnah and what is culture. So we have something written by the great scholar, Sheikh Alibani. He's explained the difference between Sunnah and culture. 
right? So you'll know the difference. Now, then we have a section about the sayings of what of the Muhammad. Now, in 2021, the leaders of the WD community, they published a book with the sayings of Warthi Muhammad. This book is filled with the ideology of the nation of Islam. We, we have it in the book. So we'll give you some quotes from the book. From the quotes, Warthi Muhammad, he said, and this is in the book that they published in what year? 2021. He said, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is my savior, and he is your savior, and he is our spiritual father. They published the book. I bought the book. I have the book. Right? Also, he said that the Jews deserve Palestine. He was given a talk to a a Muslim Jewish group inside a synagogue in Illinois. And he said the the issue of the recognition of the state of Israel and the homeland for the Jews, in my opinion, after studying the Quran and the life of Prophet Muhammad, this was never an issue with our prophet. We know that the civilized will go in a country and take property and land from the savage who are ignorant and don't know how to develop the land or don't know how to make it useful for themselves or for humanity. And we have tolerated that. If those people were not doing anything with their land and were neglecting their land, then God removed them from their land, not you, the Jews. This is what he said about our brothers in Philistine that the Jews deserve that land because the savage Muslims didn't know how to do anything with it. Then there's a section in the book, starts on page 125, about Islamic faith or interfaith. And um, so as Muslims, we know that we treat non-Muslims with justice, kindness, you know, fairness. We know that. But still, we're honest with them. As Sheikh bin Baz, he says, the best thing that you can do for a non-Muslim is invite them to Islam. Right? But we're kind to them. But we have to be honest that they are disbelievers. Wafi Muhammad didn't believe that. Right? He said, if we look at the broad definition for Muslim, we have to say that even though a Christian may be worshiping Jesus, the Christ prophet, more than he is worshiping Allah, he may be Muslim in spirit. They may still be Muslim through their... Orient, he said, no, though their orientation has dominated the Muslim urge, the person carrying a heavy cross may be Muslim on the inside. And the same applies to a Jew, a communist, a Buddhist, or Hindu. He also said, you will, on page 129, say you will find faithless persons identifying as Jews, Christians, and Muslims. We all have our Kafirs, but to say all Christians are Kafirs is wrong. To say all Jews are Kafirs is wrong. And then he says, well, what about the Christians who believe in the three gods in one Godhead? As long as they are confused, then they are not guilty. And he also said he was giving a, a he was having a interview with Tony Brown. He's a very famous journalist, and he said, seriously speaking and technically speaking, there are no non-Muslims on the earth that are human beings. Every human being is a Muslim. And he would, and he said, we should not try to convert Christians to Islam. He said. Why would you convert them? And many of them are already living better than you. He was against trying to give dawah to Christians, right? Now, there's a section in the book after that about his love for the Catholic Church. He said, you know, he has a strong desire to be Catholic if he wasn't already committed to Islam. And he went and asked the Pope to bless his efforts. And he was excited because the Pope said he would. Also, there's a section here on page 144 about the holidays. The Wolfgang community, they have two extra holidays that the you know, Orthodox Muslim does not have. One holiday they have is on Savior's Day, February 26th. Savior's Day is the birth of who? Father Muhammad, the God of the Nation of Islam. They celebrate that. There are other holidays. Anyone know about the other holiday? 
It was yesterday. New World Patriotism Day. They celebrate on, um, on the 4th of July. All right? So they have two extra holidays. Now, the next section is about the Orthodox uh, um, Alliances. Page 146. He praised the Ayatollah Khomeini and the Shiite. He said that if he could, he would take a, a machine gun and go fight with a Shiite. He had a, a friendship with cult leader Jim Jones, and he praised Gandhi. And we have something from Sheikh Taqadina Halali saying how Gandhi was an enemy to Islam. And that's in the book, too. Then we have a section about him praising Father Muhammad. If you don't know, Father Muhammad was the god of the nation of Islam. This is the man who they believe is Allah and the person, right? <clears throat> and worth Dean, he said, about Father Muhammad, he said, he came to resurrect the mentally dead. I believe God was with him. I don't believe a man could do this all by himself. And he had a book of poems. I bought the book. He has 75 poems in this book. That He, he was a poet. Inside this book, he wrote a, a poem and dedicated this poem to Father Muhammad, praising him, right? Nine. Also in the book, he defends his father, Elijah Muhammad. And this is a sticking point for the people in the community. They really have a strong love for Elijah Muhammad. Inside the book, he said, I'm happy to know that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's book, Message to the Black Man, is selling well out here. I was recently told it was one of the best sellers here on the East Coast, and that's wonderful. Now, has anybody here read Message to the Black Man? I'm going to give you some quotes from it. Because keep in mind, he, he said he's happy to know it's selling well. This is wonderful. Inside this book, Elijah Muhammad said, God is a man, and we just cannot make him other than a man. It's wonderful that that's selling. Inside the book, Elijah Muhammad said, we all know that there was a God in the beginning that created all these things, and he does not exist today. Inside the book, he said, my mission as the messenger is to bring the truth to the world before the world is destroyed. There will be no other messenger. I am the last. And after me, God himself will come. This is the book that you're glad is being sold. So, <coughs> excuse me. Many, many people in the book, I mean, many people in the WD community, they love Elijah Muhammad, and they defend him. And they say that because the black man was enslaved, oppressed, and mentally dead, it was necessary for Elijah Muhammad to teach the doctrine of the nation of Islam for 40 years for the Muslim to accept true Islam. So here's my question. Did Elijah Muhammad lie on Allah Ta'ala or not? Next question. When is it ever justifiable to lie on Allah Ta'ala? And who is more oppressive than the one who lies on Allah where he is being invited to Islam? So I know this is a sensitive point with the people in the WD community. But another question that, that I asked him in the book, I say, Elijah Muhammad was a kafir. Elijah Muhammad said, I would not give two cents for the God or the Orthodox Sunni Muslim. So my question is, which statement is more bitter to you? Are you more upset about what I said or about what he said? All right? Now, also, the question is, was, Islam, was the Islam that Allah Ta'ala sent down, was it sufficient to guide the black man, or did the black man need what Elijah Muhammad came with? That's a question, right? Do we believe that what Allah Ta'ala sent was sufficient for the black man to be guided? And then there is listed the example of the pagan idols before Islam. They were burying their daughters alive. You know, they were in a bad state. They were rectified with pure Islam. There's an example of, in India, there was a group called the Untouchables. A Salafi scholar gave them, they were Hindus, the low caste system. A Salafi scholar gave them da'wah for a couple months. They all embraced to Islam. And we know the example of Abilali Muhammad, who used to be a slave, and he was teaching the treatises of Ibn Abi Zayd 
to enslave Muslims before Father Muhammad was born. So per Islam is sufficient, Yaquan. We don't need Elijah Muhammad to bring black man out of darkness, right? Then the, last, the later part of the book is their exaggeration of worthy Muhammad, how they exaggerated about him. And the main person that exaggerated about him is he exaggerated about himself. He said about himself, he said, I know that God has blessed me with a soul and a spirit that has made me so wise and so spirit wise that I am fit to be my own imam. I am happy and proud to say Imam W.D. Muhammad is my imam. This is what he said about himself. He alludes to being a prophet. He says that Allah has blessed him more than many prophets. He said that his Savior's Day speech is more beneficial than the Ten Commandments. And also, his community, they allude to him being a prophet. They said, Imam W.D. Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him has worked his entire life for the salvation of, for, for the cause of human salvation. Imam Muhammad was inspired directly by God with the knowledge and understanding to unlock and interpret the holy scriptures. He is the one who has planted the seed that will illuminate the entire world and liberate all of humanity. And the second to the last thing in the book is there's a section about he would normalize sin. What does that mean? He would casually mention things that will make them seem normal when they're really not normal. So question, right? What's the first act of worship that we're going to be questioning about on Yom Kiyama? That's a lot, right? This is what he said. He said, I have done something that will make most of you say, oh, Allah is really going to punish him. One time I missed my prayer. I had to do something so pressing, so I just did prostration. I didn't do the prayer. I and I know Sajda was not a substitute for the, for the prayer. I still missed my prayer, but at least I showed God that I wanted to do it. I got down and counted the number of Sajdas in my prayer, and I just made the number of Sajdas and got up and left the house. So when you say something like that so casually, you make the prayer seem like it's if the imam did that. And he, and he would say things like, my dog is so generous. And then he went... I'm into a story about his dog. He said one time, you know, I was backstage at a James Brown concert, and he started talking about James Brown when he was at a concert. He said, you know, I love Dr. Robert Shuler, a Christian evangelist, and started telling that story. So I was riding in the car, listening to the Reverend Billy Graham, and started telling that story. He was talking to a group of Muslim youth at Booker T. Washington High School. And he said, you know, I was watching a program of an evangelist, and they began to sing a gospel song, and he started talking about how much he loved the gospel song. Just normalizing sin, making it seem like, okay, if he's doing it, it must be okay. And for this reason, you find that they have on on their website, 12 o'clock, Quran class, 1 o'clock, music class. Because he believed that music was permissible. And and, and this is also inside the book. The last part of the book, Yaquan, is a bit it is what it is. It's a fatwa from the Lesna Daima. There was a man who had been in their community for 20 years. He was an imam in their community. And he went and made hajj. And he met up with some brothers upon the Sunnah. And they gave him da'wah. And so he wanted to ask a question. And he took a question and they posed it to the Lesna Daima when Sheikh bin Baz was the head of it. And they asked, they mentioned about five of the things and about five things that he believed. And they gave a fatwa. I'll let you read it for yourself. I'm not using the fatwa against him or anybody, but they said what they said. And the truth is, you know, it is what it is. You know, and so that's the book in a nutshell. Um, Everything has footnotes. There are like 270 footnotes in the book. So everything has footnotes. There's audio, there's video. So everything has proof for it now. Alhamdulillah. So, but the intent was to try to give some good advice. You know, I'm not belittling the man, not trying to mock the man or the community. It's about trying to give some serious advice. And nobody wants to be responsible because all of us know that the stuff he said is wrong. So if we don't speak up, then maybe we're all going to be responsible for not speaking up. Nobody wants to be responsible. 
You know, sometimes people, they think that lying to people is being nice. Some, one brother said, you have to give wealthy mama his props. How is props going to help him in his grave? How is that going to help him in his grave? What's going to help him is stopping people from following those errors so they can stop following the errors so he's not responsible for more people following him. That's what's going to help him, not props and giving him credit and praise. So th- this is the point of the book, you know, so alhamdulillah. May Allah accept it and forgive us for the shortcomings and alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Muhammad.